I'm Abigail Ogilvie of Abigail Ogilvie Gallery in Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to the opening reception of O oh, to Be a Painting. Uh, this is our third online exhibition since the pandemic broke out. So since around March 13th of this year, I'm very excited to introduce and welcome our guest curator, Caitlin Ledford. Hey, Caitlin. Um, Caitlin is, is an artist based in Boston and she received her MFA in 2019 from Rhode Island School of Design. And Caitlin and I have worked together in the past exhibiting her work, um, most recently at Spring Break Art Show 2020 in New York City, which was actually the last in-person show we had. So very timely to have her as our guest curator, having the topic of online exhibitions, viewing art online. Um, we also, I'll drop in the link, but we do encourage everyone to go to our website. Zoom does downgrade the quality of any art we show or screen share. So our website will be the best place to view anything online. Uh, so I'd love to quickly go around. We also have three artists here. So we're so honored to have you with us. This is three of the 12 artists in the show. Um, we have Hangama Amiri, Aaron Laurie, and David Hio. So I'd love to hear from you guys, where you are, who you are. Um, I'm Hanga Mamiri. I currently live in Connecticut, New Haven. Um, I also recently graduated my MFA program at Yale School of Art. So here I am. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Erin? Um, my name is Erin. Uh, I'm a Toronto-based artist. I'm primarily an oil painter. I make large and small sculptural paintings and I'm excited to be here. So, so honored. <laughs> Thanks, Caitlin <laughs> and Abigail. Yeah, um, I'm David. I'm based in Chicago, primarily like a visual artist. And I always think these are fun. I think this is maybe like the second time I've done like a Zoom chat about art. So thanks. No, oh, good. Um, as long as people are still enjoying it, that's kind of the goal. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. Caitlin, I want to start with asking you some questions as our curator here. Um, and the first question I have is the title of the show is O oh, to be a painting and uh, we'd love to hear how that title came to be and what it means. It really was birthed from my own longing to see paintings in person again. Um, just my, like a kind of a selfish desire but I think anyone in the art world is feeling that desire and especially the beginning of quarantine when mm -hmm. we didn't actually know how long this was going to go on and after time has passed quite a bit it's like that desire has grown even more but while I'm appreciating so much in the art world how we've rallied around and created virtual exhibitions but it's also kind of this funny thing that we call them like virtual online viewing rooms instead of like calling them online exhibitions so at times it's kind of silly the way the art world has like created art jargon around online exhibitions and just the kind of like absurdity in that way of viewing something online and like it's great to see the images but yet you can't get into it and see the work in person and see how it's made and as a painter I really miss that and I know so many people in the art world are missing that as well and so that's where the name of Ode to be a painting came from because it's like Ode to be a painting in 2020 during a pandemic right now where we can't see it in person. Well and I think it's also important to point out, I, I think it's an interesting title in that for you, painting really means the artwork. I mean, not every single work in this show is a true painting, right? That's exactly it. Painting, in my mind, um, is a like way of thinking in more than just it has to be a painted medium. Like Hangama's work is primarily in fabric now, even though she's coming from a painting background, the way she uses fabric is extremely in line with how painters think about their work. So it's kind of like, yes, a stand in for the word of artwork, but also kind of trying to broaden the definition of what is a painting as well. Exactly. So we are going to um, actually, let me quickly drop into the chat our exhibition page because I forgot to do that, but we are going to do a virtual tour um, of the show that Caitlin has put together. But before we do, we actually have a quick poll question for the audience. It's anonymous, so we won't, um, here or we won't we'll only see the totals at the end so our question is do you find that except that the accessibility of having exhibitions online has improved your viewing experience in the art world so we're going to launch that poll and see your answers roll in for the next few seconds and that could be 
solely just looking at websites, seeing virtual exhibitions, seeing online viewing rooms, having events like these. Um, as of, I don't know if people are being favorable because we're currently hosting an online show, but we have 16 out of 16 have voted yes for having the experience being more accessible helping. So let's see. Yep, we got, so all of you on here, thank you for your votes. Think that, let's see, I can press share results. I don't know where that goes. Oh, um, wow. Wow. <laughs> um all of you who voted think that uh, this helps mm -hmm. your viewing experience so that's great um so let's switch over and i'm gonna screen share so caitlin actually used a hopefully are you seeing the virtual room guys yep okay great um so you are seeing a virtual uh, gallery that Caitlin set up so that you could see her curation of the show and the artworks actually to scale. So obviously, as we know, the online functionality is not perfect. So of course, the artworks won't look exactly as they do in person. And, you know, the quality of the artworks won't be the best in the world. So we can kind of Let's see, walk over here, I hope, yes, and start seeing some of the works in the show. We have Sean Downey, who has um, a more realistic painting, um, and next to Nicholas Halber, who is more abstract, and just moving around the room to quickly give you a sense of this wall. And then, Caitlin, my question for you is, um, I mean, there's really, so someone like Sean Downey, who we just looked at, he has very realistic work. I think I can get up a little bit closer here, sure. Um, you can actually see what's happening in here. So his artwork is considered realism. And then someone like Madeline Peckinpah over here has much more abstract work. Um, you can see that there's some elements that might be recognizable, but you might be more so imagining those in your own head. Um, so how did you see pieces like that existing together as you curated the show? Uh, I think it's coming from just trying to show the breadth of painting as well and not just showing like, oh, something that's completely textural. This paint, this exhibition is only about textural pieces so that you can, like you wish you could see them up close, trying to show the ability of, um, or the wish in seeing any of these works up close. Like if you were in person, I can imagine how I would look to see how does Sean actually make his painting? How does he create layers and different glazing effects on it to get to the point that it is? And how does, when I look at like Madeline's work, seeing how she can use things, like she works so improvisationally and is able to think about color and bring it all together in this way that you wouldn't look at a photograph to get there. And um, it's all just considerations. And I wanted this exhibition while we wanted to see paintings in person, also a broad range of how to make a painting as well. Absolutely. I mean, and it definitely accomplishes that. And then kind of a follow-up question is there, I mean, Josh Jefferson and Destiny Belgrave both have portraits. So how did you kind of see the portraits fitting into the show? So here's Destiny's work. My love of portraiture is a little selfishly linked to myself and my own work as well. And I'm so fascinated by how other people interpret others and the figure within their own work. And I love how both Josh and Destiny kind of um, obscure the figure in a way, but completely different from each other. While Josh's is more thinking about the paint and the physicality to create this portrait, Destiny's is more about this narrative who is daddy in the wicker? Is that her dad? Is that somebody else's dad in the surrounding environment of hers as well? So having those two together and even thinking about Sean's that has a figure in it as well, that portraiture just like contains this complete and huge range within it. Absolutely. I mean, it comes together beautifully and honestly, it looks great on our website, but I think it looks stunning in this room and it's unbelievable that I think this was some sort of free software that you use. So it, it really ties it together really well, especially as, you know, the curator actually curating. I think it's really important to have. Definitely. And to speak to the accessibility of it, I didn't yeah. want to use something like paying um, 
so much money to use someone to create a gallery when there's free things that are out there. I think the accessibility in art is super important right now. So to be able to use a free program is great. Yeah, I mean, and imagine if you wouldn't be able to have made your way to Boston to see our show, you could have looked at flat images, but this is a really interesting interactive way to participate. Um, and then one other question. So we obviously have Hangama as this large, beautiful piece on the wall here, obviously, given that it has the tech kind of things happening, there is this edge around it that wouldn't actually frame the artwork. And then Otto Goldfeld has this uh, smaller work next to it. So how did you see these being side by side without, I mean, they, they fit together beautifully um, and it really works out well, but without Otto's piece getting too lost next to such a large work. And to speak to Hangalmas, I love the, the way, yeah, the, the JPEG in the show is creating that false edge on it. So it's kind of playing with you to know that it's a fabric sculpture. And so that, yes, it completely draws you in, kind of makes you question. So you want to go up on it, like step up to the artwork and see what's going on. And then I think in that stepping up process, you see Otta's as well, even from far away. And the complexity in the drawing and the detail makes it stand on its own. So while Hangama and Otta are both extremely strong and you want to see them up close, they don't fight for each other in attention because they are so different in the way that you are drawn into it. So the scale doesn't necessarily matter in this space. I mean, it's, it, it functions differently online when it's the same JPEG size on a website. But like you're saying, being in this space, the scale is made known. But Otta's really was the only one that she holds her ground right next to Otta, doesn't get lost at all. Absolutely. Um... Yeah, I mean, it just looks great and we've heard wonderful things. This link is on our website page as well. It does take a minute or two to load um, in some cases. So be patient if you're loading it for the first time. And so based on this tour, or Caitlin, did you have another comment? Uh, somebody asked in the chat, what was the, pro the software? It's just artsteps.com. So when you click that link on the website, that's the website I used and it's a free program. Um, Okay, and then based on kind of that little tour of the room, we have another poll question to get to know you all a little bit better. Um, so we have a breadth of styles in this exhibition. Do you have a favorite? So I'll launch the poll now. And again, it's anonymous, so we won't be able to point anyone out specifically. Um, so do you like realistic work, abstract, collage, installation, or works that include the figure? Obviously, you might like a little bit of all of them, but it's just a fun poll to see who's out there, see who's watching, see what you think of the show. <laughs> um, so I'll give you a few more seconds to vote. But the votes are rolling in. Can you guys vote too, Caitlin? It says the panelists no. can't vote. No. Yeah. I guess we'd be biased. You'd all pick your own. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. All right, so we have a range here and I wasn't sure what to expect. So I think we probably have all the votes we are gonna get. So abstract is the winner. Oh, I haven't shared the results yet. So can you see the results now? Yep. Yeah, so abstract is the winner and people really also like figure and realism. So cool. that's who's out there. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron's happy. <laughs> Always. Um, is the poll still sharing or did it go? Oh, it is still sharing. Let's see, stop sharing the poll. The poll is new for me, so. Um, all right, and then Caitlin, I think up next is you get to ask the artists their questions and we get to hear from them. Yeah, this will be my favorite part now so I can <laughs> pick at your brains and learn more selfishly in that way. Um, I want to start off by asking a general question of how do each of you feel about virtual exhibitions right now since you are artists but then you're also trying to play in your head too of like i want people to see my work but also like it's not you're not seeing it in person so how do each of you feel about virtual exhibitions are you tired of them or do you like them where are you at does anybody want to go first? first um i'll go first i guess <laughs> um i feel like I'm a little bit tired of them, but I think they're doing a really good job in 
reinforcing my desire to see work in person, which I think is ultimately the goal of them. You know, it's more accessible, but it is reminding me that seeing art in person is a full body sensory experience. It's not just seeing an image on a wall. It's the environment. It's the smell, the tactility of the work, um, the sounds, lighting, everything plays a part in the experience of viewing the work. So, so far I'm seeing like a lot of these online like virtual reality galleries are pretty much they're pretty like they're they're not creating interesting environments for me personally that's what i'm feeling but like i said it's reinforcing that desire which is so it's successful in that way for me yeah i kind of agree i mean i'm not tired of it whatsoever yeah. i think it's really cool i think it's cool yeah. that you know, like when push comes to shove, the art world can adapt, right? But like going Absolutely. with what you're saying, like I like 6,000% agree that it will never replace what art can be, right? Like right. when we go see a concert, it's a full body experience, but like it's, I mean, yeah. it's not the same as watching it live on your laptop, right? So it's cool that like the art world has created a supplement. I think it's a really nice tool yeah. and I hope they could keep doing it even post pandemic, but I don't necessarily want it to be like foreverness you know i do think it made things yeah. a lot more accessible plus i feel like what you can do with online shows is create like really a fantastical exhibit that you might not be able to do in person right so like you can yeah. create these like monolithic sized works but it's not real right so i think the idea of fantasy is like really highlighted with the idea totally. of like a uh, online exhibits yeah totally i do agree with both of you guys as well i feel like um I do miss the physical connection with the art objects and in gallery spaces or that immediate of like exiting and entering that space. Um, I was uh, in Chelsea a few weeks ago and the Chelsea is not the normal Chelsea that we all know. It's like literally like so many galleries were closed and only like few were open, but even when they were even open, I couldn't enter because I wasn't allowed to because I had to book an appointment or like reserve the space <laughs> beforehand. Yeah. So it was kind of like really sad for me that I don't have that immediate um, action with the object, like to go and see and enjoy my time, right? Um, but I mean, I'm not tired of the virtual too because uh, it's not something that is really new to us as well. Like we all shared our work online in whatever capacity yeah. we had, you know, we share sure. uh, I mean, our work in Facebook and Twitter um, and Instagram a lot. So the virtual um, aspect was already there, you know, the virtual screen or the virtual sharing was already there. Um, so I'm not tired of it yet, but I am actually looking forward to so how, how we can make it, um, make it better for, you know, such times that we, still live so yeah that would be my answer for now <laughs> i completely yeah. agree with all three of you i i you. love it and i'm tired of it all at the exact same time <laughs> yeah so we're going to i'm going to start off asking hangama um about your work so your work is often about female female identity so what is the experience like of creating these complex narratives that are then posted and shared on social media as small thumbnails? It's like basically you have this large complex thing with so much meaning and it's got texture, but then it's compressed into this tiny little image. What's that, what's that like for you? It's sad, but it's exciting at the same time too, I would say. Um, I guess to answer that question, I could only say that um, in whatever form I express my art, um, having a social uh, media as a platform to show my work or to exhibit my work, it actually not only you know communicates my work with the audience in here, but also it communicates my work abroad. I guess that's my purpose uh, because I get really excited uh, when people across the world, like let's say Afghanistan or Iran or Pakistan, actually share or comment on my work. So there's like, when I see an echo or when I see, um, or when I hear an echo that shares like a similar life experiences as me or as them, then I feel like um, I have done the job or the social media have done the job. So that's how I really am interested to connect my work um, with such platforms. I guess 
at the end of the day, like my purpose of being in social media or like posting these complex, whether it's abstract or representational work, is all about the politics of representation. It's uh, who gets the chance and who gets the platform to be shared, like to be valued and to be acknowledged in the art context. So I'm using it as a very educational platform too. Mm -hmm. Right. That's such an eloquent, eloquent way of saying, I mean, it's doing its yeah. goal when somebody across the world is able to see it and connect exactly. with it in a way. Yeah. And as artists, I think we realize that we need to put aside some of our pride sometimes of being like, oh, you can't see it as well online, but realizing the greater yeah. goal of what you're trying to do with it. So that's beautiful. Absolutely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so then I've got another question for you along the same lines of what I had mentioned earlier, the way you handle sure. fabric is extremely painterly. So I consider your works to be fabric paintings. Um, how do you feel mm -hmm. about how people tend to distinguish between textile works and painting and how it's a kind of a larger conversation that painters may know of distinguishing between like craft and fine art and even yeah. just like a female craft versus like a male craft? Yeah, that's a really good question. Like, um, I think um, it's a question that I always ask when I go to studio, you know, every day. And for me, like seeing a little battle between them really excites me to know these two materials more. It's actually, it actually makes me challenge to experiment with material more and see their, um, see other dimensions and what else I can do. You know, what can painting do and what can textile do and what can textile do that painting can do and vice versa. So I guess to answer that question, uh, yes my work has painting relation but it's not painting at the end i would i'm i will be happy if uh, if people consider these work as a textile artwork because textile artwork has its own history has its own art value and everything right yes it has painting relation because i'm still interested in the painting language uh, the way i use my form my palette my context or my um or the composition or perspective, it's a very Western driven traditional painting in the history, right? But since I'm working with textile, then it's just because like the way, um, all I'm saying is just like one should not uh, elevate over the other, you know? I think it's the art world that makes such genres high art and whatever falls under that high art, which is painting, it would be like uh, law art, which is craft but for me i see them as equal always so that's would be my very short answer <laughs> thank you amazing you put that beautifully as well i completely agree with all that especially distinguishing between craft and fine art that Definitely. doesn't thank really you. exist today <laughs> no <laughs> thank um you. thank you hangama so david um mm -hmm. I want to ask you about your work now. So how do you wrestle with the relationship between color choices and the narrative contact, co the narrative content? I ask because your work has such a like bright and lovely color palette, while the narrative can have a like violent action or aggressive action going on within it. So how do you wrestle with that? Yeah. I don't know if I even wrestle with it anymore. I used to, like, uh, especially during school. I don't know. I feel like you know, like color has like its language, right? Like we all associate color with a very specific feeling, a very specific word, very specific memory. But for me, I think I learned a while back, like the world isn't really binary, dude. Like it's not very black and white. Like you can have bad times masked in good vibes and like vice versa. Like these things aren't like one and the same. And so I think more so for me is that my biggest interest initially when I was making was like, how can I create contrast? So I think if I were to use this lexicon of color that I understand and juxtapose it with like, this thing that's kind of immediately more violent or insinuates violence like what would that do for you right and like what would it do for the viewer to like look at something and be like oh i fuck with these colors but wow look how like uh i don't know the contrast is so stark i think that's where my initial thing came from but then also uh i'm like one conversation i always have in my head it's like it's kind of strange that some colors are predefined right like we genderize color which is so strange and then so I feel like in my, my brain, if I do this enough, I'm like, can I play with what pink means to me, right? Pink doesn't always have to insinuate this history of feminine, but if it's contrasted with this thing that's so heavy, like, can that then shape how I understand color? Does that make sense? Sorry, that was like a rant. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah I so think I, that's what initially drew me to your work was the color palette. And then once like, yeah. I was looking at it more and more, I'm like, oh, these are kind of violent, but I was drawn in because mm. of the color, which is amazing. Yeah. 
Thanks. Yeah. And that's like the funny thing, like so much of like the colors that I get, like where I get really excited about just like come from real life. So like, I think transformative bars are one of my favorite, like tiki bars, because aesthetically dude, it's wild. Like we all can agree, like this is a transformed space, but I think it's so funny because within this certain space that is so curated, there could be violent things that happen. Right. So I think just seeing those and experiencing those kind of reinforce this belief that like nothing is black and white, right? Like these things, like you can have bad times and good times, no matter what the context and situation could be. So I think that kind of informed how I use color in my work. Yeah, that makes perfect sense now. Thank you. And so Mm -hmm. that leads me to my next question of seeing your work in person, like I was just saying, I was mesmerized Mm -hmm. by the physical layering of the paper. (laughs) It's hard to see that online. You and I were talking when I told you Uh when I'd gotten one of your pieces, I was like, I'm so in love with the way it's actually layered. So does Mm -hmm. it frustrate you that when it's posted online or a compressed image is posted that you can't really see the layering or do you Mm kind of like the hidden surprise then that people have when they see it in person? Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. At first, I hated it. I was like, damn, people can't see that this is like art. Like, you know what I'm saying? And then over time, I think I just got comfortable. I'm like, you know what? Like, if people have seen my work in person, they know to expect, right? Like, I think one of the biggest quips that stuck with me in grad school was that, like, I used to make really, really flat paintings, like, very, very flat works. And then I had an advisor that was like, what is the point of anyone going six inches away from your work if they can just grasp the whole entire concept from six feet away? And I really hated that, you know, like, I know what they meant, but it was also kind of like, oh, damn, they're right. Like, my work does not transform when you go farther and closer away, which I think is one of the benefits of painting, right? Like, especially with this show, like, there's so much texture, there's so much mark making. So if the gram flattens out my work to the point where it does look flat, that's fine. That's technology's thing, you know? But I think it's just, in my mind, hopefully more rewarding when people actually see my work in person and then see that it is transformative, right? There is something worth seeing. Like, what does it mean to make dynamic small works that can challenge the strength of mighty paintings, right? So I think me just pouring all my energies into like textures and layering can, I just want to contest the idea of what what is intimate small works, right? Like not all small works have to be cute and delicate and quiet, you know? And so I think, yeah, to answer your question, no, it doesn't bother me, you know? Yeah, you learn to adapt in that way to transform your yeah. work, even your also like your predispositions, predispositions of thinking that it can't be flat. And so even your advisor asking you like, well, what's yeah. the point of looking at it then? It's like, yeah. does it have and it's like, to? It's like real yeah. talk. Like, yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. a thing. And I feel like that's what, what's really interesting about Instagram in terms of like painting. I feel like, dude, like in the last five years, painting in itself has taken a weird turn, not in a bad way, but like, you got a bunch of millennial painters that grew up with cartoons and like the idea of flatness resonates with our upbringing. So like with the circulation of images, we understand imagery now so different in the, in the same way of like language. So it's kind of funny that like in the last five years, like flat painting really blew up and not in the sense of like the long history of art, but because of the artists and how they're raised, right? And I think that's really cool. And then Instagram really, really flatters flat work, which is like, I think, byproduct of flatness being reinforced right so right when you're that. used to seeing something flat all day why would you not make work that was in flat in person if that's your yeah. vocabulary at that point yeah for sure yeah mm-hmm. yeah that's great thank you so much david yeah of course so i'm gonna ask aaron you a question about your work now um sure so I've only ever seen your work online and it gives me such visual ASMR to the point that I can imagine like what the, what it would feel like to touch and squeeze it. And so for those who don't know what ASMR means, um, it's basically, <laughs> I didn't it's, basically it's like when you um, hear something that kind of gives you the chills a little bit. And so thinking about how, what visual ASMR would be like seeing something that gives you like such a visceral feeling. That's what I think about with Aaron's work. Um, with that being said, it's, it's shocking how well your work holds up online, given the texture of it. It's crazy. So what do you think is missing from viewing them online then versus seeing well, it in person? There's a few layers to this for me, but first of all, just to, this is a small painting. So small paintings naturally, tra- like if they're textured, they naturally translate better because you can get closer and see the the surface quality blown up in a way so anything larger than like I don't know three by four feet gets compressed you lose the sense of surface quality and um and detail and for me like I'm trying to pay as much attention to the power of the image as I am to the handling of material and they both 
reinforce each other and, and reinforce the narrative that I'm trying to tell that I'm also discovering as I make the work. So like if you're missing out on the texture and the surface quality, the brush strokes, um, you know, the difference in like whether paint is reflective or absorbent or thick or thin or whatever, um, you're missing half the story for me. And like part of the reason why I make these paintings or so actually the main reason why I shifted from realistic figurative work that was mostly like monochromatic drawing with graphite and charcoal um, was because I went into a small gallery in Toronto eight or nine years ago and I was the only person in the space and there were these three monolithic paintings. There was a triptych by Harold Clunder and his paintings are built up slowly and deliberately in layers and layers over the course of like 10 to 15 years and they had such a physical presence and I felt like it, it hit me. It was such a visceral experience. And I wanted to, I knew in that moment that I wanted to make paintings that had the same type of physical presence that was like analogous to the human figure or spirit or something in the room with you. Um, and so if I think about what's missing when viewing paintings online, light for me is something I'm always considering it actually completes the work. I'm always trying to create a sense of light glowing from within the painting, but also the light in the environment brings the painting to life. And so if you take away the possibility of maybe like shifting temperatures and light in the room or if the paint, depending on where the painting is, obviously, um, the quality of light, you really strip away the possibility of the painting to transform and shift and uh, in turn transform you and like I'm using texture because I'm also playing with shadows and playing with the with um, drama of the piece so I like that the painting is literally in a constant state of becoming depending on where you're viewing it and light is critical to that and also okay also like what's lost in translation so <laughs> And there is a lot lost in translation. Like we've all looked in like his learning about art in history textbooks and then actually seeing the work in person is always like, first of all, moving from one book to another, the color is different, the printing quality is different. And then in person, again, you're seeing, you're actually being drawn into the process of that the painting was made by like a Monet painting. How many of you have seen a Mo Monet painting in person and like had no idea that it was built up like that? And um, so yeah I always think about like there's for example there's this one color that I use it's a phthalo blue green and I have yet to find a camera that can capture that color properly and I use it in almost every painting and it either registers as blue or green so like the technology that I mean I just haven't found the right camera I guess but that's like the most important color in my practice and no digital camera can capture it. So like there are, there is so much cap that's lost in translation, but again, like, you know, I'm trying to like balance the two, the process and the image. And I've also noticed that viewing my work on my phone and on the computer has changed the way that I make the work. So I realize that I'm actually trying to compete with these like luminous backlit images that we look at every day. That's like how we always see art. So I'm always trying to create these like high contrast, luminous, diffuse gradients of light in my paintings. So it's interesting how, you know, one informs the other and it's like this cyclical, um, again, yeah, like it's, it's just informing the work in a way that I didn't really realize for many years, so. And that's yeah. something I thought about even uh, looking at your work as well as the, your ability to create brightness with oil, super opaque oil paint is ridiculous, especially when I think about <laughs> all of the really bright images I see online because they are backlit by a light. Yours totally. still, I can see that it's brightness is from the oil paint, which any painter knows that like once you make thick paint and you kind of cover up the canvas underneath or anything underneath, starts to get a yeah. little dark and not very reflective <laughs> but yeah, you're can. still able to maintain that brightness that's just ridiculous and when you were talking about actually like photographing and lighting it it made me think like what would happen if one of your paintings was lit from underneath then and so absolutely I, think I, wish I could see it more in person <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that I'm gonna do that
Yeah, because I can, now that you say that, I would completely transform it the way you would think about like photographing a sculpture is probably how it, you think about photographing your paintings. Totally. Also, one thing I forgot to mention is like, I always think about painting's ability to slow you down. Like, and that's a part of its appeal to me personally. And I think like seeing artwork online, like our attention span is so, like I think I read somewhere it's like under 15 seconds or it's like eight seconds or something, but like, on when you're looking at something on on a screen you're not like having this meaningful you're, you might not be having a meaningful dialogue with this one thing because there's like sounds and notifications and tabs open and like there's always something kind of popping up to distract you from actually connecting with this object or you know what i mean so it's like it's like a different quality of attention that you bring to work in person than you do to the internet or on just on the device. I completely agree. And that was definitely one of my considerations for making this show too, was the fact that online viewing doesn't let you be immersed in it. Because like you just said, you have notifications coming up, you have different folders open, you've got different tabs, maybe you're listening to music, but I mean, you could do that in person, but <laughs> yeah. different things that you're putting along with the experience that would have not yes. happened if it were in a gallery. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Erin, and thank you all three of you so much for like answering my questions and letting me pick your brains about your work. And these are all questions that I wanted to ask anyway, just from knowing your work, but especially now when being a part of this exhibition, even more so just thinking about like being online and how we're, we are thinking about our, our paintings in relation to being online now. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And we actually, we have um, a few minutes for some audience questions. So if you haven't typed in a question yet, please, we welcome you to put it into the chat, whether just to the panelists or to everyone. And we have our first question is for David. Um, someone wants to know, can you tell us the background uh, and meaning, inspiration for your piece in the show, Exerting Agency? Oh, like you would just give it away? <laughs> yeah, I can like, I can like. <laughs> No, I can loosely talk about it. It's not a bad thing. Um, yeah, I mean, like, so I work from home. And so, like, I have to create this, like, really strict work schedule. And usually when I make something every day, I, like, tend to reprocess things that I've experienced the day before. So it's not that my work is self-therapeutic, but it's, like, this conduit for me to, like, unpack, right? My, my, my work is not meant to heal me. It's just to unpack stuff, you know? And so I think when I make pieces, I think a lot about like things that I see throughout the day or like, you know, like something I'll see in the current day, it'll make me think about something that happened like four or five years ago or something in my childhood. So it's like this really long tangential wave, right? And so I think with that piece, I was hanging out with some friends and just seeing like this dynamic between two of my friends that are dating. And it was like this weird, like patriarchal dynamic. And I was like, it's kind of weird to do today, you know? And like, I was watching it and I think just like the little instances of like their relationship made me think a lot about my parents relationships and so when I was making this piece I think I was just like bringing in like all right my awareness as an adult like man seeing this shit today and thinking about how I felt as a kid witnessing that kind of similar dynamic and how am I going to tie them together right and so I think that's like the general um what do you call it intent that I had when I made this piece but I don't think I'm gonna give away the whole entire story because then it's just like you see the work in one singular way, which is my point of view, which is like fascist. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like so I really appreciate that <laughs> someone really wants to know the narrative so bad, but um, I think it's just a lot more interesting knowing like, all right, so these things that I pull information from, like they could be from like 15 years ago or happening today, but it's still resonant. And so I think mm -hmm. that's probably the most biggest takeaway, you know. Mm -hmm. Did that answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> That was great. <laughs> Give enough away. And then, so maybe for the cool. other, so someone asked a general question, but could probably go to any of you. So whoever wants to answer, feel free. Um, is there a piece of art that you remember seeing that gave you permission to do something in your own work? I think I answered that in my question I earlier. Do so I, I not can... answer that. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like asking. Wait, am I dumb? I don't get this question. Yeah. It's actually, <laughs> no, you're not. Okay, I was like, what? like, I heard it, but. Is there another artist's work who you felt 
maybe gave you like the green light to do something in your work that you might not have otherwise is I, is what I'm interpreting as. I Aaron. guess. Uh, oh, Aaron? Aaron? Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Oh, no, you, no, 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 you go ahead. Oh, you, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I guess for me, um, it's a really good question, actually. I feel like uh, we all know that art comes from art. Like, we all have references. Mm -hmm. We all see other artists who inspires us, who motivates us, who, who kind of show us all these green lights or red lights, all of that. I guess for me, I, my favorite artist is Kerry James Marshall. And when I see yeah. Idaho's paintings and when I see Idaho's genre of painting that how he built this community um, of painting in the language of painting and, you know, bringing like the black American communities or like pan-African um, or Africanism, uh, you know, language in the art history, it's very important for me to look at his body and then somehow see a reflection of myself in it too, because like, majority of my work has been referenced to his paintings and it gives me you know such an honor when I see a reference of him into my work right but for me it's really important because like when I see a reflection there it's because like I'm also interested too so how can I as an Afghan women artist bring such community in the art context because the representation again or the representation of my work is not much seen or from this culture is not much seen in the art history so if he can do it through painting then if my if my work is uh, you know dealing from textile then it's a green light for me you know it's like it tells me that like um, the art has a space for us too you know the world has a space for every parts i guess you know so um i don't know if i answered the question but i always think that wow well, um yeah that's it yeah that was a good answer that, that, was, yeah. that was great yeah <laughs> yeah aaron did, yeah. You, did you still want to answer aaron or? uh sure mine's mine's like maybe you know not as epic as that answer but um <laughs> one time i <laughs> One time I heard uh, Laura <laughs> Owens talk about how every time she approaches a painting, she gives herself permission to start totally fresh with that painting, like wipe the slate clean. Like you always mm -hmm. have, like, I guess to like let go of like the weight and like the possible burden of art history in that moment and listen to what that specific work of art is asking of you. So it's more about opening up a conversation with that particular piece. And uh, that was just like a small thing that freed me up to, yeah, just like let go. And I guess it really is about like being in the moment with, with the piece, um, mm -hmm. like a collaboration with the piece more than anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, uh, I think it's okay. I think the whole point of being a fucking painter or an artist is to fit yourself in this long dialogue of art history. So if you don't feel like you can steal from other artists and literally there's no point, right? The whole point of stealing is because there is something that you appreciate that resonates so hard in their work that if you continue, it'll become your own language, right? So like canonically, mm. people like me do not exist in the Western art history. So therefore I am allowed to take whatever I am inspired by, learn it, master it into my own language and then create my own work. So I think that's yeah. the point. It's like looking at these artists that you admire or see as inspirations and like wanting to wedge yourself in that same dialogue so I think it's okay to like, you know, look at a painting, look at anything and be like, oh yeah, I like this a lot. So like thinking about the answer with Carrie James Marshall, I remember seeing a show at the MCA and I was like, geez, this guy can paint, right? Like, dude, it's wild. It's like so incredible to be like, yeah, not only is he good yeah, at painting, so but like, <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, dude, like, also like the right. intent of every work is like hitting home. So it's like, yeah. right, so like, I think it's totally natural for every artist to go to a show and feel like, oh, I need to work harder or my work is inadequate right because there's something that you're like feeling with that other artist's work that really gives yeah. you like the push to be like oh i want to be like that so i think that's the importance of like that question that was asked and if anyone disagrees with us totally. i think it's just like really insecure about stealing i'm like dude it's not mm -hmm. a bad thing you know like it's not <laughs> yeah. i mean i even find myself at other gallery shows texting my you know assistant director being like why haven't we done a show like this like yeah yeah <laughs> it's just like don't... this whole yeah it's like a building right. of a conversation you know yeah right yeah, we don't sure. as artists we don't exist in a vacuum and it's almost egotistical no. to say that oh i i don't look at anybody's work or i don't steal from anybody <laughs> it's like oh you're so great you don't look at other people yeah. and like, oh wow that's cool. yeah <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, yeah. 
Good answer. I almost think that's a good one to end on because I think that's something maybe we can leave our audience with. I mean, whatever industry you're in, like think about the person that maybe inspired you to be in the role that you're in and wherever you are in life. I mean, I know I have a gallerist who I, Meredith Moses, she ran a gallery for 30 years. She's in her eighties and she's still selling art from time to time. And she was my mentor mm -hmm. and someone who I wow. learned from. And there's always kind of, everyone has someone who shows them the ropes and then you turn them into your own. No, no. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, it kind of extends beyond just being an artist. So think about yeah. who has inspired you and who knows, send them a thank you note, maybe send them a thank you email. It's a, it's a strange time right now. I know everyone's happy to hear from other people. So, um, yeah. Yes, and right. thank you guys, all the artists and Caitlin for being on today. This has been absolutely <laughs> wonderful. We're all available for, if you have follow-up questions, um, send, us an email, we can connect you with the artists or um, you have our Instagrams probably or could find us very easily. So feel free to DM any of us. And, um, thank you guys so much. Thanks. Yes, thank you guys. Thank you, thank you everyone yeah, who's been watching. Yeah, thanks for coming everyone. <laughs>